Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vaga Maradian here in Northern Virginia at the Air Force Association headquarters to talk to retired United States Air Force Lieutenant General Dave uh, Deptula, who is the Dean of Aerospace Studies at the Mitchell, or I should say the Dean of the Mitchell Institute for Aerospace Studies. Uh, Dave, uh, you were the first, uh, Air Force's first intelligence, uh, surveillance and reconnaissance uh, boss, uh, founded some 13 years ago, uh, when the chief at the time said, hey, you know, General Schwartz said it's vital for us to be able to put this new architecture together given that we have all of these challenges facing the service. Uh, at the time, we were joking that it was becoming the United States analytical force because so much horsepower was going to analyze the data that was coming off of all of those remotely piloted aircraft feeds. Uh, uh, your successor in that job, Lieutenant General Dash Jameson, was here, unrolled the new roadmap. Uh, you were the last person flight to plan. do flight, flight plan. plan. Excuse we, me, we flight plan. In the Air Force uh, got it, got it, got it, got it. Ah, uh, okay. Um, uh, it was funny because somebody this morning called it a road map as well, but it's a flight plan. Uh, talk to us a little bit about this flight plan. What are the key uh, elements of it from your perspective? Uh, you know, is it on the right track and what comes next? Uh, first, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to chat about this. Um, I believe that what General Jamison has done uh, is a magnificent step forward to moving the intelligence, reconnaissance, and surveillance, uh, or intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance, uh, enterprise forward to get us to what I believe will be the next big thing in military operations on the part of the United States. And that's to establish a seamless and ubiquitous means of sharing information amongst all of the platforms from each one of the service components. What that means is it's really a different operating paradigm. It's not just aircraft carriers operating on their own um, or armor divisions on their own, or aircraft force packages on their own, or space constellations operating on their own, but rather all of these entities being tied together and acting as a source of information into a larger, what we uh, come to call a combat cloud environment. So what General Jameson and her staff has done is said, look, we, we've got to we, we've got to move toward actualizing this vision. And she has laid that out very well in her new ISR flight plan that consists of uh, several annexes to address the specifics of each one of uh, some of the challenges that will, will be necessary to get to this fused environment. And so what are some of the steps that get you there? Understanding that this uh, flight plan, a lot of it is highly classified, uh, but it was still a remarkably open uh, conversation. General Jameson made clear at the very top of it. Uh, the goal here is also to be able to get that ubiquity, to get that sharing in highly denied airspace. She's like, we got very, very good at doing this over permissive airspace. The challenge right. and the trick is doing this over uh, denied airspace, especially when our adversaries are developing specific systems to interrupt all of those data, to try to break these chains at multiple points. Right. What are the key elements of this plan that you can publicly discuss, given that you also were involved in advising the formulation of this, yeah. that you can discuss that goes aside from, as one retired flag officer told me in there now, a general officer told me was, hey, look, you know, I heard a lot of great bumper stickers. The question is whether or not this is a deliverable. From your standpoint, what are sort of the key steps that can be discussed that gets to you to that place that everybody wants to get to? Well, well part of the problem is that you, you, you are from you, your position tends to be from where you have been in the past. And what General Jameson and her staff is trying to do is, is to get beyond that. You know, our systems and architectures, uh, to a large degree, are based on mid 20th century constructs. Uh, we're still in this transition era between an industrial age of warfare to an information age, and that's what she's trying to do. So specific to your question about what are some of the steps. Number one, it's accepting the vision of wanting to share information. Number two, the realization that we can do that with some of the platforms that we have. I'm gonna, I'm gonna use an example. F-35, a lot of people beat it up for a variety of different reasons, but they don't understand nor talk about the fact that this is one of our premier sensors and has the ability to operate in contested airspace. This is what, what we found with using F-22 in Syria. We valued it there not for its ability to shoot down other airplanes, 
hadn't shot down another airplane. But we don't launch any missions in Syria um, without F-22s because what they do is they suck up information, share it with the rest of the force, and increase situational awareness. When we need to do that with every spacecraft, with every aircraft to include cargo aircraft, with every ship, with every surface vehicle. Uh, and so the biggest challenge is getting people to understand that paradigm shift. Uh, specifically, a challenge will be in the, re the robustness, the redundancy, and the resiliency, which is the latest buzzword out there. Uh, but it's a good word. It's an appropriate it word for what it is. It is in terms of the ability to achieve the connectivity to make this happen. Uh, and there's not a solution set yet. Um, the way we're going to get there, though, is beyond just RF or the traditional radio frequency uh, preferred data links that we're at today. Yeah, data links will be part of the solution, but they're not the only part. And it's not just going to be RF. Optical communications is, is another option that needs to be looked at. And we've got commercial companies out there that are developing that kind of architecture. Um, so the other one that I'd say is a, is a linchpin um, that we need to meet, and Joan Jameson talked about it a bit, is multi-level security. We're going to be operating this combat cloud uh, paradigm with other nations. And so they have to be an integral part of this. Now, now part of the solution is that by mechanizing and automatically uh, 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 allowing connectivity at the appropriate security level, um, using things like artificial intelligence will actually help in this regard rather than hinder. So those are some of the, the major challenges as we move forward. Um, this is also, though, um, a joint challenge, right? I mean, I think each of the service chiefs, you've heard them talk about uh, the vision. I think that General Goldfein was a little ahead of the power curve in talking about the importance of the battle network, um, it, about how you stitch the force you have together better than necessarily focusing on the individual systems. That's important, but you can get a lot of capability, a lot more mass if you manage to stitch together that which you already have better. This is a long-term project. <laughs> uh, it will require everybody to get aboard it, right? Because, Absolutely. Uh, so talk to us a little bit about, it from an implementation standpoint, you talked about the acceptance of the vision. I think that generally the acceptance, um, we're, we're close to that because everybody's talking about it. General Milley's been talking about it. Admiral Richardson is talking about it. General Neller certainly has as well. But what, from a deliverable standpoint, what are the steps that the entire joint force, I know that General Dunford has been thinking about this. I know that Secretary Mattis has certainly been talking about and thinking about this in terms of some of the task forces he's got going on. Talk to us about what are some of the steps that have to happen, how long this process is going to take, at what point do we start to deliver those kind of quantum capabilities? You know, it's a flight plan, so give us a couple of the IPs here as we're, you know, uh, the waypoints as we're going forward. Well, um, we wrote a 160-page report for the Office of Net Assessment last year to outline very specifically where we need to go to answer the kind of questions that you're talking about. Um, now, it, 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 it will exceed the amount of time that we have here today to go to, into each and every one. But number one is the acceptance of a vision. And you talked about each one of the services has an approach, and they do. But we need an overarching joint or at an OSD level champion for this whole paradigm shift and then get everybody on board, not dictating exact solutions or a particular operating system because that's virtually going to be impossible. There are too many services, there are too many participants in a combatant command arrangement, there are many companies, there's many, many countries. Uh, and so the vision's important to then allow folks to get to the point where they can build resilient and interoperable networks. The tension here is the services do the organize, train, and equip function. The combatant commands do the employment function. So we also have to bridge that gap, too, um, such that everyone has vectors pointing in the same direction, that being an end state of ubiquitous and seamless sharing of information across entire joint force task forces. Uh, and that's where the whole combat cloud notion comes in, right? I mean, Denny Mercier was uh, the right. former chief of the French Air Force who's Supreme Allied Commander of Transformation. He's going to be stepping down shortly. Uh, uh, General Lanata, the former chief of the French Air Force, that's a job where right. f former chiefs of the French Air Force go. Stéphane Abrial being the founder of that and General Jean-Paul Palmero is following 
uh, suit, all highly capable officers. And General Mercier was one of the people who was the first to talk about cloud combat, uh, employed it a little bit in Mali when he was the Air Force Chief to sort of demonstrate it, operationally proved it. He's championed it at Allied Command Transformation. Do you think that that combat cloud system the sooner we embrace it, the better off we're going to be as, no, a, as a joint force. Absolutely, that's what I mean in terms of having a common vision. Today, each one of the service chiefs talks about this construct, but they use different terminology. So it's confusing the people. Um, but as you just mentioned subtly, the French are moving out on it. The Royal Air Force is moving out on it. They're, they're embracing this whole notion of developing a combat cloud and moving forward. So we, we need to do that too. And the sooner that we do that, the more aligned the vectors that each one of the services will be heading in the, in the, in the right direction that we need to get there to be able to actualize this whole notion of seamless and ubiquitous sharing of information. Retired United States Air Force Lieutenant General Dave Deptula, Dean of the Mitchell Institute for Aerospace Studies. Sir, always a pleasure. Thanks very, very much. Thanks, Fago. Have a great day.